The truth is, there's almost no idea more un-American than the notion that any one person could choose the American president. And I will always be proud that we did our part. On that tragic day to reconvene the Congress and fulfilled our duty under the Constitution and the laws of the United States. Hi again, everyone. It's five o'clock in the East. A stunning new account of the vice president's experience during the January 6th insurrection provides some brand new context to those comments you just heard there. In an excerpt obtained exclusively by NBC News from a book out next month called Frankly, We Did Win This Election, the inside story of how Trump lost, Michael Bender of The Wall Street Journal writes of a dramatic break between the former president and his second in command on the day of the insurrection. One horrified, the other transfixed. Bender writes this, quote, a swarm of rioters just outside the room had smashed windows and busted through doors and now prowled across the wax sandstone blocks floor beneath the iconic cast iron dome. Pence's life and the safety of just about everyone else in the Capitol that day rested in the hands of the National Guard. Quote, I want them down here and I want them down here now, Pence firmly instructed during a private phone call with the nation's top military and defense officials gathered at the Pentagon. Initially, Trump seemed to be enjoying the melee, heartened to see his supporters fighting so vigorously on his behalf. He watched more as a passive spectator than as the president of the United States, who had helped incite the violence unfolding little more than two miles away. Trump didn't call off the intruders until almost 4.30 p.m., about a half hour after Pence had called the Pentagon looking for support from the National Guard. That never-before-reported conflict between Trump and the man whose life he endangered, just one of the latest examples of Trump's most loyal allies privately breaking with him in the aftermath of his election loss. There's also this weekend's account of former Attorney General Bill Barr, who had willingly subverted the reputation and integrity of the Justice Department in service of his ex-boss. Brand new details about Barr's last few months as AG come to us in an interview with ABC News' Jonathan Carl in The Atlantic. In the piece, Barr exposes the big lie for what it was. Quote, my attitude was it was put up or shut up, Barr told me. If there was evidence of fraud, I had no motive to suppress it. But my suspicion all the way along was that there was nothing there. It was all bull bleep. Barr ultimately made his findings public. On December 1st, he told the AP the Justice Department, quote, uncovered no evidence of widespread voter fraud that could change the outcome of the 2020 election, a statement to which the ex-president did not take kindly. Carl paints a vivid picture of Trump's anger over it. He reports that soon after the AP story went public, Trump confronts Barr, asking, quote, how the F could you do this to me? Why did you say it? Quote, because it's true, Barr replied. The president, livid, responded by referring to himself in the third person. Quote, you must hate Trump. You must hate Trump. End quote. Barr thought that the president was trying to control himself, but he seemed angrier than he had ever seen him. His face was red. But as Charlie Sykes uh, of The Bulwark writes, don't cry for Bill Barr, America. Quote, for Barr, as with Mike Pence, there was a line that even the most devoted toadies were not willing to cross. On one level, that's hopeful. On another, it is hard not to be cynical about the amount of denial, delusion and self-loathing that went into their performative sycophancy. They knew what they were getting into. They knew what they were doing. They knew who Trump was. And yet they worked to empower him until they could not anymore. Two of Trump's most serious and loyal aides speaking out today is where we begin with some of our favorite reporters and friends. From The Washington Post, senior Washington correspondent and MSNBC political analyst Phil Rucker's here. His new book with his Post colleague, our friend Carol Lennig, is called I Alone Can Fix It, and it comes out July 20th. Also joining us, Matt Miller, former chief spokesman for the DOJ and an MSNBC justice and security analyst. Olivia Troy's here, former type, top aide to Vice President Mike Pence, now director of the Republican Accountability Project. And as promised, Eddie Glaude is still here. Um, I want to start with you, um, Olivia. You know Mike Pence. Mike Pence was reported to me to sort of have been stunned by Trump's political depravity, by the fact that there was no line he wouldn't cross, by his indifference to human suffering around the pandemic. But why was he surprised that Trump then turned on him around the certification on January 6th? He'd seen who Trump was. 
Well, he certainly has seen who Trump is firsthand. We lived that together for quite some time. But I think that, you know, at the end of the day, I think when you're the vice president to this man and you're literally working down the hallway for this entire time, I think somewhere in Mike Pence's head, he thought that you know, he, they were in this together and that Trump knew that he was a loyal person. He rarely, you know, shared daylight between the two of them. He was completely loyal his entire tenure while there. I saw it firsthand. And so I think I think he was shocked uh, that day when he goes in to certify the election results. And I think that what happened and the way it played out was shocking to him. And I think the reality of the situation was on full display, that Trump is loyal to nobody. It doesn't matter if he's going to put your life at risk. He's going to do what we all know he's capable of doing. It's really just about him. Um, I want to stay with Pence, with you, Phil Rucker. This is also from Michael Bender's new book. Quote, after the election, Dominion filed a $1.3 billion defamation lawsuit against Sidney Powell, who defended herself by claiming that her allegations were too ridiculous to be believed. No reasonable person would conclude that the statements were truly statements of fact, Powell's attorneys told the federal judge presiding over the case. Pence laughed out loud when he read the court filing. I was very surprised at her statement, Trump told me. Pence, meanwhile, refused to go along. Anything you give us will review, Pence told the president, but I don't see how it's possible. That stance would make him enemy number one a few weeks later. Phil, I want to ask you something that I think I've spent a long time over the last four years asking you. You know, was it inertia that kept the people who knew better quiet? Was it that it didn't endanger Pence's life until his family was hunkered down and rushed out of the Capitol on January 6th. I mean, what bought their silence until the very, very end? Nicole, I think it was all about political power because they knew they didn't just have to, you know, go along with and believe what President Trump was saying. They had to go along and believe what tens of millions of Americans also believed because Donald Trump uh, as a candidate and then as a president had this extraordinary ability to sort of bring his supporters into his own alternative reality. He would, you know, concoct these theories and spread these conspiracies and tell these lies. And yet so many people in our country believed them uh, and were loyal to him because of it. And so that power there, that political uh, power that he had to bring all those people together was in very way, in a real way, very threatening uh, to somebody like Mike Pence, who didn't have that same kind of political power and knew that his career could crumble uh, if Trump decided he wanted it to. And so there was this intoxicating sort of pull uh, that drew people like Pence and Barr and others in the administration closer to Trump, even as they knew what he was saying uh, was simply not true and, and in fact dangerous for the country. I mean, the fact that not one person was willing to sacrifice their ambition to do for the country is the reason we're here. It's the reason hundreds of people attacked the Capitol and erected a noose to, quote, hang Mike Pence, their words, not mine. I want to turn to um, Bill Barr. Uh, Jonathan Carl, Matt Miller, has an extra, really interesting interview. It's, it's interesting mm -hmm. in substance, and it's interesting in its existence. Um, let me read a little bit more from it. Barr told me he had already concluded it was highly unlikely that evidence existed that would tip the scales in the election. He'd expected Trump to lose and therefore was not surprised by the outcome. He also knew that at some point Trump was going to confront him about the allegations and he wanted to be able to say that he had looked into them and that they were unfounded. Let's stop right here and stop any parade plans for Bill Barr. Bill Barr did the unprecedented and unleashed the United States Justice Department to look for election fraud. I think for the first time, you're not supposed to do that until after an election is certified. Bill Barr looks under the hood and when he's absolutely certain there is none, then and only then does he tell Trump that he won't go along with the big lie. Why do you think he's talking, Matt Miller? Uh, it's it's the same uh, for the same reason that that uh, Phil said about Mike Pence. It's absolute political self calculation. Right now, um, he's trying to burnish his own reputation after the fact. And I think when he did finally speak out on December first, it had nothing to do with trying to save democracy from Donald Trump. It was trying to save a Republican Senate from Mitch McConnell. The article makes very clear that was his motivation. And the way he portrays himself in this article, it's almost as if he were a bystander to Trump telling the big lie. When, in fact, he was one of the very people help, helping tell it. The big lie didn't start on election night or the day after the election. It started in the weeks and months leading up to the election when Donald Trump was telling a story, uh, uh, telling lies about voter fraud. 
and and the attorney general was out there doing the same. I, we we you talk, we talked about it a lot on this show at the time. He was out you know doing a tour of conservative media, making claims about supposed election fraud that the Justice Department had to retract on multiple occasions after he made them. So to to you know try to claim now that he came out to do the right thing when you know he, his actions show that he was telling the lie until. He couldn't do anything to save Donald Trump. The Justice Department can't go into court and make up claims with no facts. If you do that, you end up like Rudy Giuliani, disbarred. And so he and and so he couldn't do anything to save him. All he could do was speak out, and he spoke out against him because he wanted to save the Republican Senate, ultimately unsuccessfully. But I think that's the the, the story that that, that 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 that's the real story about what Bill Barr was up to.